Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us here today to uh, give the public and the press a progress report on uh, the work our administration has done to reduce violent crime in the city of Cleveland throughout uh, the summer months. As I said at the start of the summer, uh, this administration was deploying an all-of-government approach to reduce violent crime during the months of the year that we know we experience an uptick in violent crime. And that theory of change was rooted in a couple of key tenets and principles. First and foremost, we recognize that violent crime in our city and in most cities across the country occurs in a small part of our geography. Data tells us that 4% of respective cities in their geography uh, is responsible for nearly half, half of all violent crime. So taking that theory of change, taking that data perspective, we did a three-year look back to see what parts of the city had high incidences of violent crime, and we identified five citywide hotspots that we focused on uh, this summer. And we prioritized a targeted, data-driven approach to not only deploy aggressive police response and resources, but also ensuring that almost every department uh, inside of City Hall was deployed as well, too. Everybody from public works, building and housing, public utilities, aging, community relations, and the Office of Prevention, Intervention, and Opportunity were all deployed in these critical hotspots over the summer months. So what did we discover and what did we do? So not only did we have the men and women of our police department walking the beat, uh, members of the cabinet all walked the beat throughout the summer, talking to residents, uh, talking to small business owners, talking to tourists about what we could do to keep our city safe and secure. And I think it's important to note the data that you see here on the slide. Uh, the Department of Public Works, led by uh, Frank Williams, uh, they completed 779 work orders across all five of our hotspot zones throughout the summer months. Everything from illegal dumping uh, sites to street sweeping uh, to graffiti removal uh, to dead animal pickup because we heard a lot of complaints about groundhogs in the city of Cleveland. And then in terms of building and housing, uh, we know that when you see a dilapidated property or a vacant home or a vacant lot, in many cases, it's a playground for criminal activity. And the Department of Building and Housing, led by Sally Martin O'Toole, uh, created 261 uh, records to complete and have already closed nearly 80% of those complaints. So together combined between the Department of Public Works and the Department of Building and Housing, uh, they have been tackling over 1,000 complaints in just several months as part of our all of government approach to reduce violent crime in the summer months. And there were a number of different departments as well uh, that were engaged in this effort from aging to utilities, from the utilities department fixing 353 street lights to the Department of Aging doing uh, summer walks with seniors. Uh, we were all on the front lines in these hot spots to address criminal issues, but also to address neighborhood complaints that our residents were focused on. Now, uh, I want to just point out um, one case study that really spoke out to me and the team here uh, this morning. Uh, we were doing one of our first uh, safety walks in zone one, and we uncovered a, a very um, troubling dilapidated property. Now, this property was purchased on uh, 1993 in October. Uh, it closed due to probate in 2023 because the person that died in that home didn't have somebody in their family to transfer that property onto. It caught on fire uh, last January, and it was boarded up and boarded up and boarded, and boarded up. And this property was one of the most frequent hotspots of complaints from uh, the folks in Zone 1. And so working together with our Environmental Crime Task Force Unit, and Public Works, we demoed the property, and now it's safer because of the work 
of this administration, but also because of the great advocacy of the neighbors and residents of Zone 1. And then lastly, before I kick it off to a Deputy Chief Pillow to talk about the law enforcement component, you know, one of the things I think it's important to recognize is the importance of keeping young people uh, safe and secure in the summer months. I know when I was growing up and when many of folks behind me were growing up, uh, we were allowed to play in the summer, but when the street lights came on, we had to be in the house. And so uh, the Office of PIO and Community Relations engaged thousands of youth this summer. Everything from the a million dollars of funding we deployed to a grassroots organizations to engage young people or the work we've done with pastors that were walking the beat in hot spots to the fact that we employed uh, over 1,200 young people with YLU. And they made over $2 million in wages, putting money in the pockets of youth this summer months. All those things played a role to keep more young people out of the streets during the summer months and not involved in criminal activity. So with that being said, before I kick it off to Deputy Chief Pillow, I want to just say this. We are currently right now in the third district, uh, the place where uh, Jamison Ritter uh, called this home uh, for years as a member of our uh, police department. And not only did we lose uh, Jamison Ritter uh, this summer, uh, we lost many lives as well uh, this summer due to violent crime. Just last night, a young person, a teenager, was murdered. Uh, one homicide is too many. And today is not a mission accomplished moment for us as a city, but it's a data-driven, fact-based update on the work this administration with community organizations and neighbors of Cleveland, what we're doing to do whatever we can to reduce violent crime. As I've often said, reducing violent crime and keeping our city safe and secure is a group project. It's a group project. Government can't do it alone. We have a lot more work to do, but today is a positive milestone in terms of the work we've been doing to reduce violent crime in our fair city. With that being said, I'll kick it off to Deputy Chief Pillow. Deputy Chief. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, everyone. Um, in May, this administration came to um, me as well, talking to you about our plans for addressing violence throughout the course of the summer. Um, right now, we have our latest statistics that we are in the process of evaluating to see what worked, what didn't work, and how we can improve on things. But these are some of the statistics from what we termed Operation Heat Wave. Operation Heat Wave ran from May 1st through August 31st. Um, as you can see, these are some of the statistics. These will be provided to you all by uh, Sergeant Diaz. But this was an effort from the Cleveland Division of Police and several of our law enforcement partners that I mentioned earlier. Uh, in particular, I want to thank Ohio State Highway Patrol, who partners with, partnered with us not only through the summer, but continue that partnership. In fact, we uh, will be uh, doing another detail with Ohio State Highway Patrol in the very near future. And those will continue over the next couple of months. The Ohio Investigative Unit, uh, a huge asset and partner who has been working with the Division of Police for a number of years. They've really stepped it up and have been assisting us with a lot of complaints dealing with alcohol, guns, and uh, trouble spots throughout the, the city. Uh, the U.S. Marshals, uh, we have created our own entity uh, within the division to work on our uh, wanted individuals, individuals with warrants. The marshals have uh, really assisted us with that, with providing training and uh, allocating resources to our NICE unit, which has really beefed up what we do in terms of seeking out individuals who've been identified as committing crimes and apprehending them. The numbers you see, uh, guns recovered, these are guns recovered from during arrests, during search warrants, at crime scenes. Uh, these are not guns just turned in. These are guns that have been recovered during actual investigative uh, activities. The residential search warrants, and I want to clarify, investigative search warrants versus residential search warrants. Residential search warrants means we actually went into a home, 
uh, with probable cause. The investigative search warrants might be cell phone records. It might be DNA. It might be uh, for uh, uh, to search a vehicle. But those were all key in obtaining or filing up on the residential search warrants. Adult parole. That number you see, that, that, uh, that 923, that is a huge number. Uh, some of it resulted in arrests. Some of it resulted in identifying individuals who needed other assistance to stay out of trouble. Um, so it was not all arrest based, but it really, really was a proactive effort in getting out into the community, showing the community that we care, as well as showing individuals who've been released. That we're keeping an eye on them, and if they want to be conducive and fit into society, we're willing to help them. And if not, there was that component to remove them again. Uh, the felony arrest, the misdemeanor arrest, and the warrant arrest. I want to jump in front of something. There was a report that we pushed out earlier, and it was a, a, a number of 577. I take responsibility for that. I had added these numbers up. Um, we've since broken it down. But total in arrests, over 700 arrests throughout the course of those, uh, those three months. Narcotics. Uh, I want to thank our commander of Bureau of Special Services, Commander Kincaid, and his team with uh, narcotics as well as our CJIC and DEA partners. Uh, some substantial seizures over the course of the summer. I won't talk too much about them, but I can tell you that while Operation Heat Wave was a short-term effort, there are some long-term investigations that have developed from that. And uh, hopefully as we, in the near future, when we talk about those, I will reference them back to starting with Operation Heat Wave, but a very, very productive uh, time frame with those guys. The results, uh, big numbers. Over the course of the summer, uh, approximately a 30% reduction in homicides over the summer. As you can see in uh, 2023, like the mayor talked about going back three years, comparing the numbers. Homicide down almost 37% over the summer. Felonious assaults down 13%. Robbery, rape up 4%. Uh, I've spoken with our sex crimes unit and uh, our commander there. I wanted to make sure that we did not have, uh, because the number is up and that concerns me, but we wanted to make sure that we have no indications that there is a, a serial rapist or a one individual responsible for these, but that number is up. Our total violent crime down 13%. Um, and again, this is a result of the efforts of this operation. Next steps. Um, like with anything, you have to see, we have to evaluate what we did. Um, we've done it. We need to take a look at what worked, what didn't work, and what we can improve upon. Uh, I want to thank the district commanders, all five district commanders, as well as our traffic commissioner, for thinking outside the box, um, exploring new options, trying some new things that we're weighing to consider. Do we continue these into the next few months? Do we take these into next year? And how we improve upon these things? Um, and again, these are a ton of the partners who helped out, but those are our stats. When I, when we started talking about this in, in May, and I want to go back to something else, one of the things that we talked about, there was a, a huge component and a big complaint that we heard citizens uh, reaching out to us about was traffic. Mm -hmm. And our traffic commissioner and our traffic unit did a really great job with this. Also, the district cars. We, we created fast response cars to answer radio calls and to be free to proactively do policing. And the districts and the district commanders did a really, really good job. So I, I always want to thank our partners, but I really want to go back and make sure that I recognize the men and women from the Cleveland Division of Police for the work that they did. Um, some things that we'll be continuing, our warrant sweeps, our uh, details with Ohio State Highway Patrol, our own violence crime reduction details, and as well as an overall assessment of what's working and what's not. Thank you. And before we get to questions, I, I would just say, as Deputy Chief mentioned, um, this is, again, uh, not complete. Uh, we have a lot more work to do uh, to not only address violent crime and get the numbers down even more, uh, but really address the perception of safety in our city. And so the work we're doing around the built environment goes a long way. The work this administration is doing to invest in historically disenfranchised neighborhoods goes a long way. And the work we're doing to have more trauma-informed care response models for the victims 
of gun violence goes a long way because data means one thing, but I don't want anybody in our city scared of gunshots. And as I said before, uh, one homicide is too many, uh, but we as a community and as an administration must continue to work together to keep our city safe and secure. And we must support the police department as they do the hard work of keeping our streets safe. We'll take some questions. Mayor, yes, I just sir. got a 911 call. Somebody reported a woman being attacked in a downtown parking garage. Person called 911. Police never showed up. Three hours later, dispatch called that caller back and said, do you still need the police? This happens more often than just once in a while. How can it be acceptable for people to have to wait hours for police after calling 911? Well, Ed, um, you bring up a good point, but I also want to just say this. Um, I'm not aware of that 911 call, but that line of questioning and that attack against police is what makes it harder for us to recruit the men and women to join our ranks. And I would tell you this, uh, the, over, the, 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 the over the 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 over the over the over 1,100 men and women who serve our police department are working their tails off to get to every call, to solve every homicide case, and to keep our streets safe. Do we have more work to do as a city? Absolutely. Uh, that's why we hosted a expedited hiring event just last week to recruit more men and women to our police department, and we're going to do our darnest to increase response times, but this data shows you that this division of police is working their tails off to keep our streets safe and secure, and we're going to not, we're going to keep our foot in the gas to do just that. Well, it, you, you want to respond to that, tonight? Director Drummond or yeah. Deputy Chief? Yeah, um, right, to that point, what do you say to citizens tonight, since hiring officers takes months? Uh, <clears throat> like the, like the, the mayor just said, we just had a, a successful hiring event, expedited hiring event, where we actually offered 101 uh, uh, candidates the uh, offer letter. So it, it's working, we believe it's, it's working. Ed, you mentioned about the 911 call and so forth, and I just don't wanna talk about isolated incidents and so forth. When we receive those type of uh, information like you just uh, gave to us, we have a duty and responsibility to investigate, to see what overall, to see what happened and what transpired and so forth. We like to provide a response, but we like to know specifically what happened in that particular instant sure, that you just brought up. But it's important to understand, and the mayor said it very, very clearly, the, the division of police and the men and women are working tirelessly. 24-7 to respond in a timely fashion, in a safe fashion, to the calls of our citizens. And they'll continue to do that. They're working extremely hard, and I'm proud of what they're doing out there. Do we have more work to do? Absolutely. We're going to increase our, our, our response times. That's part of our responsibility as leadership. We're going to give the officers the tools that they need to be successful out there, provide the best possible service for our community. Great. Next question. Mark. Uh, so, so there's lots. You did a walk with the chief downtown weeks ago. Yeah. It seemed like it was pretty successful. Um, I did that same walk too, like about a week ago and heard from a lot of downtown businesses and residents that you know, are familiar with the DSP, the Downtown Safety Patrol, and you know, officers on West 6, et cetera. But a lot of them still want to see more police on the street, foot patrol. I'm curious what your stance is. Like, do you think, and as the Deputy Chief uh, Director, do you think we need more foot patrol downtown? Do we need more of a police presence, like on the sidewalks? Um, what's our, just what's the general stance on it? Yeah, we certainly want to continue to work to elevate the police presence, not just in downtown, but in all of our neighborhoods. I know that uh, the downtown service unit does a fantastic job working with RTA and the Downtown Cleveland Alliance around uh, keeping downtown as safe as possible. We also work very closely uh, with all the major businesses downtown uh, to coordinate resources. Everything from the private security that you see at East Fourth uh, to the security that you see with uh, the casino and those uh, hotels. Uh, and then I would also say this, uh, across all five police districts, I've given the command to make sure that we are aggressive around quality of life uh, enforcement, those nuisance issues, those things are leading indicators to violent crime in many parts of our city. And so I know that's a priority for the chief and the safety director and a priority for me as well too. Anyone add to that? 
Yeah, our, our plan, we work that with uh, Downtown Cleveland Alliance, like, like the mayor says, on a, on a regular basis. We partner with them, we meet with them on a regular basis. Same thing with 3rd District Commander, Commander Tucker, I'm not quite sure if he's here or not. Provide the, the resources that they need down there to be successful. Uh, part of it is not only his uh, resources from the downtown uh, patrol or safety units, but also from the mounted unit who goes down there on a regular basis, also from the traffic unit who also is responsible for providing patrols in that area and specifically from the downtown services unit. They have a car that's actually assigned specifically to that area, which is the public square area, and that's their duty. They're responsible there. Sometimes they're out on foot, sometimes they're out on uh, bike patrols, but that's their, their responsibility. Not only is that their responsibility to be uh, engaging, but also enforcement-wise. Their enforcement in that particular area has gone up substantially. We'll continue to do that, but it's a partnership working with the businesses down there, Downtown Cleveland Alliance, and all the businesses to make sure, again, that our office is there on a regular basis, and they are coupled with our partnership with RTA. Great. Yeah. Um, so you said that the numbers, senior numbers are down, but the way you feel is another thing. So how are you guys able to keep track of this approach from the center and seeing how successful it's yeah, we, we, we had this conversation in cabinet uh, uh, on Tuesday morning. Um, I think first and foremost, uh, we are going to continue uh, these kind of uh, summer safety walks uh, year round um, in our target hotspots. Uh, it's important that members of the city uh, see members of the cabinet walk in the street, fill the complaints around housing, housing code violations or fixing potholes, just that continuous presence. You know, I'd say secondly, on the perception of safety, I think it's more uh, grassroots community conversations with key stakeholders. Just last week, uh, Chief Sonia Pryor Jones and other leaders of my cabinet hosted uh, the first ever Thrive Conference on violence prevention, talking to folks that are at the grassroots level who are on the streets every day trying to keep our streets safe and secure. So getting their feedback on how City Hall can be a better partner in terms of safety. But I would also say this, um, the media has a role to play in this. It's important that we sh share positive stories about what's happening in our city, uh, not just when a young person gets killed, but when that 15 year old uh, gets a scholarship to college or when that 21 year old uh, comes back from jail and starts a business. There are positive things happening in our city and it's important that we tell those stories as well too. Yes. Um, so, can you kind of go more in detail about the hot zones? Like, what areas are you guys focusing on where crime happens most? I think, of course, we don't want to give that the aura of, oh, it's here, it's there, and scare people, but we do want to know where you're doing that work. Deputy Chief. So, one of the things we talked about earlier was using uh, a data driven approach to where we deployed our resources, trying to police smarter. Uh, <sighs> We utilize uh, our GIS mapping. We utilize uh, boundaries and, and complaints from district commanders, as well as our crime statistics to see where the most crime is happening at, where the repeat crime is happening at, and where the most violent crime is happening at. And we do that for each district. We look at more than one area in each district, but um, again, trying to police smarter, we deploy those resources and we try to do it in, a, in an instance where it's happening at a certain time. Wouldn't make sense to deploy a ton of resources there at 11 o'clock in the morning when that crime is happening at 8 o'clock at night. So those are the kind of things that we look at and that's how we deploy those resources. Um, but again, throughout the course of Operation Heat Wave, as crime moved, we had to move as well. We didn't just say, hey, this is where we're going for the next three months. We evaluated, we took a look at where things were happening at and where those crimes started peaking at is where we would move those resources to. Yeah. I have a couple questions. So just the, the time frame of the summer comparisons that you did in the last few years, is that May to, uh, is it like Memorial Day to Labor Day or what time frame are you looking at there? I believe it's from May 1st to August 31st. Yeah. And then my other much more difficult question, <laughs> um, so you have people fixing lighting, addressing abandoned houses, uh, potholes, all these things that are, uh, you know, statistically and a study show are known to prevent crime. You also have all these uh, arrest statistics. Mm -hmm. um, is there violence prevention in the sense of, you know, things like addressing housing, drug use, substance use after an arrest happens? Is there are you seeing like we, we 
found you know X amount of fentanyl in this neighborhood, so now we're going to get public health in here, not just yeah. arrest. Chief, Chief, you want to chime in on that one? Sorry, President. Um, thank you, Mayor. I think one of the points that Mayor made is that we are evaluating a lot of this in the here and now so that we can do better. Um, one of the ways in which we do provide services in community after a crisis takes place is through our social support specialists. Uh, we have a unit in the PIO office of social workers and youth development workers that are able to partner with other departments across the city like Community Relations Board where they will go in and they might pick up a case um, and manage a case um, with an individual that's a Cleveland resident that might be struggling with some of the issues that you've named. I think one of the things that we'll also be doing in our work ahead through our dollars from the Department of Justice grant Cleveland Thrive is deepening the coordination not only of our city partners but also our community based partners that are in community doing that type of preventive work. So that's something that you're analyzing now, not quite yet. Yes, exactly. Yes. And I want to have uh, Director Woodson, I'm going to call you for a little bit, talk about the adult diversion stuff that we've done with young people and, and how that's benefited the community. Sure. So over the summer months, we actually worked in conjunction with police 8 p.m. to 2 a.m. And what we were looking for were actually youth under 20 years old. And what we've been learning through our work at these hot spots that have been identified in the neighborhoods, that most of the youth that we saw that were out past curfew were food. Mm -hmm. um, they're utilizing these 24-hour gas stations and convenience stores because they're hungry. So we're trying to work with our PIO partners and our county partners in identifying what can we do to address this food issue of not being able to eat after school hours or especially during the summer where you don't have the same programming that you do with CMSD and some of our schools are providing meals in the evening. So I noticed that you have the prosecutor's office and the sheriff's office up there, but I don't see like the courthouse. So how much, how much is the city able to kind of divert people from going through the criminal legal system? So that's a very good question. So we have uh, multiple programs. Deputy Chief, Cody. Yep. So uh, it's a very good question. We have multiple programs set up. Our officers have 24 hour access to diversion centers where we can take individuals uh, that we come in contact with, get them help for what they need, uh, behavioral health, uh, substance abuse issues, get them divert them to this center instead of going to jail and filling up the jails. We have part, great partnerships with the juvenile justice uh, court where we have the CALM program where we can take our youth and get them to another family member's home as opposed to taking them down to the DH and, and housing them there for the night. So there's a, there's a multitude of different uh, partnerships that we have where we can divert them from the court and still hold them to a level of accountability but not putting them in jail and, and into the DH or into the county jail. Can you explain the homicide numbers? Because the, the homicide numbers that you put out and sometimes we see from homicide from the medical examiners, they're different. So yes. can you explain how you come up with yours? <clears throat> so, and this question has come up quite a bit. Um, homicide, the term homicide is uh, an indivi individual killed at the hands of another. Our homicide unit has a higher number of actual homicides. But within the last three to four years, with some new legislation, uh, it's caused us to reevaluate what numbers we report. Uh, uniform crime reporting has criteria for murder. And uniform crime reporting is the, the FBI stats, what they consider a homicide. And there are a couple key words that kind of reduce that number. It's not the same as our, our actual investigations. We may have 90 investigations, but according to uniform crime reporting, uh, justifiable homicides are not included in that. And again, within the last three to four years with new legislation, that has uh, really forced us to, to relook at how we do things. Also, negligent homicides factor in. So. We get this discrepancy with the media every year. We say, hey, we had 160 homicides, and the media says, well, if the FBI says you only had 140. Uh, we, we have to balance that. It's something that we're working on right now. But again, it's something we've evaluated with, with new legislation and the, the frequency in which cases are deemed justifiable. That's not something we had before, so it's something that we're working on right now. Right, because, oh, because people will see that 
there's been 95 homicides or 95 calls out for homicide, 95 homicides, but you're reporting a much lower number. So the public wonders, well, I know somebody was shot on my street, but when I look on, online, I'm not seeing that. Yes, and, and we are working on the road. We're, we're still working on it ourselves, but those are what those numbers are. Deputy Chief, one more question about your numbers there. The 474, I think it was, felony arrests. Of the felony arrests, how many of those people were not charged? I don't have that breakdown yet. I can, I can look into that and get to it for you. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because when you guys have put out stats before, it always says we made this many arrests and this many ca cases, but the true number of the people taken off the street is lower. And, well, and it was actually significantly lower at the mid and mid May. So, well, um, or mid June, January. Or I, July, don't think, sorry. I don't think the numbers are lower yet. Well, I know the numbers are not lower. The arrests are the arrest. If we say we arrested 100 or 400 people, we arrested 400 people, we took 400 people off the street. Now, they have due process. They have to go through the, the, the process of courts and so forth. And uh, our detectives still have to do their investigation and so forth, still have to take information to the prosecutor's office. The prosecutor's office have to look at the information and make a final determination whether or not they're going to charge these individuals. So it's still a process. But when we say we arrested 400 people, we arrested 400 people. I just want to make sure we're, we're clear with that. Yeah. Um, we're aware there might be a curfew happening in public square. Um, <laughs> Midnight is what we've heard. Just wondering how that will be enforced and then who does that kind of target and why, just so we still have a vibrant city life in that area. Uh, we're not targeting anyone, but I understand your question and so forth. Uh, the ordinance that we're talking about has been ex in existence. We're just going to make sure that we enforce the ordinance. Uh, we're in the process now of working with uh, DCI, Downtown Cleveland Alliance, um, relative to signage to make sure that we have sufficient signage in public square, uh, or every entrance, every exit, so people know what we're doing. Again, we're just enforcing the laws that are already on the books and so forth. And it's also to understand is, if someone is walking through, that's fine. Uh, also, as we start the enforcement process, we're going to warn. We want to make sure we give people ample opportunity to know that we are enforcing the current laws that, that are on the books. So it is going to be enforced. We're going to warn people, and then we're going to actually start citing individuals who are in violation of our ordinance that's currently on the books. Do you know when that might begin? We want to make sure, again, that we uh, have the signage up. That's extremely important that we socialize it to the general public, what we're doing and the changes that we're enforcing. And that's part of our downtown uh, uh, safety patrols, have them out there, the officers, the uniform officers and so forth, will be enforcing that statute. All right, last um, question. Uh, shootings, neighbors have said shootings are through the roof. The murder rate might be down or homicides. Do you track shootings? Yes. And what is constitutional, you know, what not constitutional, what, what, what are your parameters for shooting? Are they up or down? Because they're down. Over, overall, our phone assaults, our shootings, our phone assaults are down, which is phone assaults could include shooting, stabbing, someone get hit by a baseball bat that's considered phone assault. Overall, we have our non fatal shootings and we have our fatal shootings. And overall, our phone assaults and shootings are down. Those numbers are down as well. Do you track shootings uh, where a person is not? Sorry. Yeah, last question. Yeah. Uh, you know, they have a huge tree, but compared for the, like, a, you know, security, we have small things, but the huge tree, no lights, you know, so many streets, and the tree is, you know, over 100, maybe you get concerned for the tree. Great. Talk to Marty Keene. He'll make sure you get some lights on that street. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody. We appreciate it.